Kamal, it's great to be able to speak to you today. And um, we're all really keen to hear about your um, your career. But before we start with your career, let, let's talk about your early years. Um, tell us, was journalism in your blood? Uh, thank you so much, Mark. And look, thank you so much for inviting me to do uh, this podcast. It's a real pleasure uh, uh, to speak to you. Mark, you and I go back uh, many years and... Um, obviously through your leadership journey and, and your career um, uh, has always been great conversations that we, we've been able to have uh, over many years. So I'm really grateful to you for um, inviting me onto, onto uh, this podcast. Journalism, no, wasn't in my blood. I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, hu- I, I'm probably not a huge fan of, of the notion of, you know, I was sort of born to be a journalist uh, personally. It might work for some people, but no, certainly not for me. Um, I had no familial links uh, into the industry. Um, uh, so it was something that that came to me, and I'm sure we'll get to this at some point during our conversation, but it came to me at at quite a moment in 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 my time. It was actually a university. But when I started as a, a you know, out on kind of just being being a child and growing up, um, I think I was pretty much like, you know, most kids maybe growing up in the 70s and 80s, I grew up in West London. Um, I remember one of the first jobs I ever thought I wanted to do. We we, we lived under the Heathrow flight path. Um, uh, and so planes were a very big part of how you grew up. And the days that Heathrow had their flight path over your house, you knew about it. And the days they didn't, it was quite peaceful. And I remember from that, Mark, um, the first thing I can ever remember wanting to be was an air traffic controller. It's because I thought, well, that looks very exciting, um, air travel. And in those days as well, you still had Concorde. Uh, and so it was particularly noisy when Concorde came across, but it all looked quite exciting. So no, journalism wasn't in my blood. Um, the first thing that I can ever remember wanting to be as a young child was an air traffic controller. And tell me about your school days. Were you were you um, uh, were you a bit of a swat at school? Did you work hard? I mean, what, what do you remember of school? So I come from a really straightforward, ordinary background. My mother um, uh, was a teacher. Uh, my father was a research scientist. Um, he worked at Moorfields Eye Hospital. Um, so I came from a background where education was really important, um, you know, for my mother's and my father's side. Uh, my father, sadly dead now, but uh, he came to the UK in the 1960s from Omdurman in uh, Sudan. And he had a very strong notion of you needed to work hard at education to take the opportunities that were before you. I had a very similar attitude uh, from my mother. So I was very fortunate that I came from a very normal background, but but my mother and father, you know, and lots of people have been through this journey, taught me the value of education and I suppose of working hard. I suppose, Mark, you're right. Sometimes I was called SWAT, being a bit of a SWAT, um, in a negative sense, which I always find a little disappointing that working hard is seen as somehow not the cool thing to do. Um, But I went to my local primary school. As I said, I grew up in West London, uh, in sort of really ordinary suburban West London. I went to my local primary school. I went to my local comprehensive um, with people of all different talents and mixed abilities. I think that was incredibly useful for my career in journalism to understand that people came from all sorts of different backgrounds. We had people from the posh parts of Ealing, of which there were many. We had people from the places that weren't so um, economically strong uh, in the borough. And we all mixed in together. And I think that was really important. And I think the final thing for me was, as a mixed black man, you had a very different experience from others. Um, Obvious racism was much more rife in the 70s and 80s. I remember the National Front, um, you know, literally marching down the street calling for the repatriation of people like me. We weren't that long after the Enoch Powell, Rivers of Blood speech era. You had this overhang as a person of colour growing up in the UK of 
that notion that people didn't really believe you either should be here and if you were here that you shouldn't have the same opportunities as other people and I was always very aware of that and I think that's the immigrant experience I'm a second generation immigrant obviously born in the UK but whose father was is from was from Sudan I think that's a a, a pretty typical experience of um um uh of 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 immigrant you know of immigrants into the UK or people who come from immigrant families and immigrant backgrounds, particularly if, as a person of colour, that is a very obvious part of your of your background in the UK. So a very ordinary background, but a background that did instill it in you that working hard was the way you were going to get on. And that was your access to opportunities. So yes, local school, local primary school. I went walk around the corner to my local primary school. My mother still lives in the house I grew up in, in Ealing. Um, then walked to my local comprehensive, mixed in with everyone. And then to university, I was uh, very fortunate to go and um, study politics at Leeds University. And, and at school, what subjects were you good at? I mean, were you good at English? Did that? Yes, in those days, Mark, it was much more divided. I'm delighted now, um, you know, my young people now will take mixed approaches to the notion of science and arts and that mix. I remember the famous, the famous Steve Jobs quotes, Steve Jobs quote that the successful person of the future is a mix of an engineer and an artist. I think in my era, that was less clear. You did one track or the other. You were human- humanities or science. And I was from that generation where you had that rather cliched notion of I wasn't very good at science or I wasn't very good at maths. I think people are now um, teaching those subjects in very different ways. And I'm sure I would have been, had a much more enjoyable journey in those areas, maybe if I'd been at school now. But I was seen to be good in those days at, yes, English, um, history, um, essay writing. I loved, I used to write in my spare time, um, you know, poetry. And I, I loved, yeah, I loved writing as an art form. And we we came from a musical family as well. So I was quite fortunate, you know, through my mother to be to be completely normal that we'd have a piano in the house I had piano lessons I went to the local music school on Saturday I was a I played the bassoon so I was in Ely Youth Orchestra which was a wonderful uh, youth orchestra very you know had a very prestigious um, name in the youth orchestra uh, world so I was, I was lucky enough to you know, travel um, to Europe with the youth orchestra to play in amazing places um, in London in particular with the youth orchestra. So I was very fortunate, particularly from my mother's side. My grandfather was a choir master and, a, and, a, and an organist. Um, so I was very fortunate to have that. So um, yeah, I was good at that sort of art side of, of the fence, so to speak. So it sounds as though there were some things in your early years that equipped you for your... Um your career in terms of writing, in terms of performing, in terms of feeling confident in front of people. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, Mike. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that. But yes, I was I was quite used to yeah, playing. You know, you'd have to um I was very nervous, uh, interestingly, um, practicing. I was very aware that when I practiced, you could hear if you walked past in the street. <laughs> so I was very aware and always worried that schoolmates would walk past the front window and see me practicing, you know, the violin, the bassoon, the piano. I find that quite cramping. But you're right, actually, Mark. I I got to learn, I suppose, yes, how to perform, how to do exams, how to turn up. And then, yes, in my writing, I did love, I did love writing. And my my mother again, you know, introduced me to the joys of books. Um, and my mother would read to me every night and I would then read myself a huge amount. And so, yes, there there are, yes, actually, Mark, yeah, there are some connections there. And then why did you choose politics and why did you choose Leeds University? Was that a fair way from um, Ealing? It's a fair way from Ealing. My uh, mother's family are actually from Rotherham, uh, just outside Rotherham. So I had sort of Yorkshire in my blood. I always wanted to... Horizons then, Mark, were much smaller 
Um, we didn't have the internet. We, you know, you watch the world on the telly, maybe you listen to it on the radio, you read it in a newspaper, but it wasn't available in the same way. My daughter's 23, my son is 20. It wasn't available in the same way as it is um, today, the world. Um, and for me, it was quite adventurous to want to leave London. Um, and uh, I was always, you know, we used to go to Yorkshire for holidays. Um, I had family there on my mother's side, so I was very used to that sort of part of the UK. And I was always quite keen on the idea of of, of getting out of London and, and seeing a different city. I, I wouldn't have considered a life abroad or anything. You know, now, of course, studying abroad is is seen as very ordinary for many, many young people. But for me, that would have been quite a leap. As I say, I was a very ordinary suburban boy from traveling into London. Central London was a pretty kind of crazy night out, to be honest. So um, going to Leeds was was quite a big adventure. Um, but I was always I always wanted to sort of not get away from London, but to experience something different. I remember I think I applied to Sheffield, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester from memory. Um, and politics, I was always fascinated by politics. Um, I read a huge amount. Um, the Kinnocks were well known uh, in our area. Um, uh Neil Kinnock lived and his family lived just around the corner from where we lived in Ealing um, or had a house there, obviously not a constituency house, but his London home. Um, uh, Stephen and Rachel Kinnock went to my school. Um, uh, I think Stephen was the year or two below me and Rachel, I think, is a little younger again. So we we, we sort of we, we, we sort of um, could see, you know, politics sort of in real life almost. Um, and. Uh, that created sort of a passion in me. I also also remember um, uh, there was a teacher at uh, at my school in sixth form who took British government. I didn't take British government as A level, but it was a it was an option. And I remember Mr. Crow, his name was. I remember him speaking to me, asking me why I hadn't taken it because I was obviously interested in politics. I used to follow politics a lot. I would I would generally be that person who watched the party conference speeches from all the main parties. I would be that person wasn't quite William Hague, but wasn't far off um, uh, my engagement with politics. Um, and Mr. Crow said to me, I'm really surprised, Kamal, that you didn't take government as an A-level. And I must admit, Mark, it was a bit of ignorance. I took English, history and geography as my A-levels because they were sort of in front of me and I was quite good at them. Um, and it was he put in my mind, you should think about doing politics at university. And I went up and did actually, I took geography initially, and then again, it shows this issue, Mark, of often an individual will frame something for you as a young person that changes your route. And I took geography initially at Leeds uh, and politics as my minor because of what Mr. Crow had said to me. And one of the postgraduate teachers at um, when you did your minor in politics, you had the postgrads would teach you some of the basics of of that side of your um, academic career at Leeds. And she took me aside and said, Kamal, I feel you're really, I'm not sure she said really good at this, but really engaged in politics. You know, I knew the arguments. I loved reading the initial texts, whether that was Hegel or Locke or Marx or whoever it was. Um, I, I feel you're really infused by this. Have you thought of changing um, degree? And literally, Mark, just like Mr. Crow, I kind of said, no. Uh, OK, can I do that? And she said, well, you can. And I, and I think you should. And it was that conversation maybe halfway through my first year at Leeds when I was actually majoring in geography that again changed the trajectory for me because getting back to the journalism bit, it was that move where I met again a very singular person in my, in my kind of life's journey, which I think is so important for people, a guy called John Rigby. John is still a, a senior editor, he's now a senior editor at the BBC um and john was on the politics course and i was slightly in my second year casting around for something to do because you know i've been to freshers fair i've done a bit of this and that i wasn't actually i thought i was quite good at athletics but i wasn't good enough to do it at university level so i was slightly cast around john said you should come down to the student newspaper it's quite a laugh and i said yeah okay john i'll, I'll come down i do not really thought about journalism i was kind of still in that space of oh i might be a lawyer oh maybe i'm going to be a politician 
And I went down, Mark, to lead student newspaper. It was in the basement in the Polytechnic, which was then the Polytechnic, because um, it was a joint product from the university and then, then what was then called the Polytechnic. It was in a basement bar. You walked in. There were pints of half-drunk beer with fags stuck out in, in them, you know, in the olden days when you could smoke inside. You know, it's pretty dank, pretty rough place. And I walked in, Mark, and then something clicked in what this was, journalism, this notion of trying to inform your audience about what the university was up to, what it should be doing. I remember writing my first article, doing my first headline, and suddenly realising, Mark, wow, this is a thing. This is really important. It brought together my enthusiasm and passion for politics. As you said, Mark, I loved writing the power of words. And then I suppose a values piece, Mark, for me. You know, my values were how do you empower people? I went to a very ordinary school and I saw the differential. You know, at my school, very few black students took A-levels. My school was was a third and a third and a third, a third white pupils, a third mostly South Asian pupils, and a third black, mostly Caribbean uh, heritage pupils. When you got to sixth form, it was half, half white and South Asian heritage. A lot of black pupils in those days were so appallingly treated by the education system, not my school particularly. Um, uh, but uh, Steve McQueen went to my school, um, the artist. Um, he was a couple of years below me and he's spoken about his experience um, in school. Um, as a young black man uh, who wanted to be a director and a creator. And I think the values that that instilled in me that somehow, as I would frame it in my younger days, life wasn't fair and why was that, was an important part of what I grew up with and realised and could see starkly in front of me. Some people succeeded not because of the wit of their brain, but because of their background. That seemed wrong to me. And journalism was an empowering thing that helped you tell stories in different ways and help people navigate the world and be informed. And suddenly I realized that journalism was my home to make the difference to the world that I felt I wanted to make a difference in. And you started your journalistic career in Scotland. So how did that happen? That was for love, Mark. Um, I had a very wonderful girlfriend. At, um, uh, I went to City after Leeds. I went to City University, which is the postgraduate uh, journalism courses. There's there were two sort of two in those days. Two of the the big journalism schools in in the UK were City and Cardiff. There were others as well, which were brilliant and actually have come to the fore much more. But the two all of us wanted to get it to, into was one of those two, um, and. Uh, I was very, very fortunate to get into City, onto the City newspaper course. And I met a wonderful person there and we were together and she got a job at BBC Scotland. Um, super, super smart. And I, I was very glad to follow her. I still had that slight thing. City obviously was London. So I was back to London and I still had that slight, wasn't that adventurous. I thought at the time it was super adventurous going to Leeds and then obviously doubly super adventurous to go to Glasgow where BBC Scotland uh, is headquartered. So she got a job there and I followed. Um, and just a little story about my first job um, into, into journalism, my first sort of proper job. I did apply for the BBC trainee scheme and uh, uh, failed to get that. So every, anyone who's listening to this, the failure is not an issue, I, I, I hope. Um, shouldn't be an issue for you. So I failed to get that, but I did probably a quite clever thing. Uh, I don't often do clever things, but this was possibly one of them. Um, they said, uh, so sorry, Kamal, you've not been successful. You know, Would you like feedback? I said, yes, please have the feedback. Always take the feedback. I think that's always useful for, for you. And they And I asked who had got the job. And they told me who had got the job. And what I did, Mark, I wrote to the newspaper that person was going to be leaving in the future. I just wrote them a letter, very old school, wrote them a letter and said, hi, I'm Kamal Ahmed. I am a um, student journalist. I've done City University. I would love to come and see if I could work out at your newspaper, a small newspaper just outside Glasgow in a place called Dumbarton, the Lennox Herald. And um, 
they got my letter. Yes, thanks so much for writing. No opportunities at the moment. We'll keep your letter on file, the usual answer. But then, of course, a couple of days later, one of their reporters announced to the paper he was leaving to join um, the trainee scheme at the BBC. And the editor thought, oh, didn't we just get a letter in from someone saying, you got any jobs going? Oh, well, we have. Let's get back to him. Um, and so it was rather fortunate that that journey, rather than taking, oh, I haven't got the BBC job, that's a bit depressing, and being a bit depressed. And I think this is one thing which I've maybe been quite good at. I thought, OK, what's the next line? What what do I do with this? Rather than just going, oh, I feel a bit sad. OK, find out who there must be. There's going to be an opening somewhere because someone's going to leave their job to do this job. Why don't I go for that thing and see if I can get there? And actually, it worked. And I got my first job in Scotland at the wonderful Lennox Herald as a local journalist. And that's a great example of your entrepreneurial skills and ability. <laughs> Possibly, Mark, come yeah. Across more and I more think you learned, people. Mark. I don't know if you've had similar experiences, and obviously as a father now. But I think I, I learned that always be looking for the what we might call now in business world, the pivot. OK, so that hasn't worked. So what's the pivot? And I've always been quite like that in terms of, I, I think you're right, actually, in business, you, you know, you and I now are, um, you know, founders of, of businesses. Um, and the pivot is important. And so what, what came next? So you've moved to Scotland. Um, you've started as a, a reporter uh, on, a, on a local paper. Um, take us from there. So I loved it. And again, it was all about... I covered the council. It was a very divided council. So there was lots of very interesting, you know, work to cover. It was always about trying to serve your audience, which was the residents of Dumbarton, the Vale of Leven, Alexandra, Helensborough. Those are our local towns in our area. The paper was nearly 150 years old. You know, it was a, in, in the community, you know, there's the guy from the Lennox. People would literally come up to you in the high street and say, hey, you should put this in the Lennox. And I learned a huge amount in my two years there from doing my first that horrible phrase, Mark, but your first death knock where a family member has died and you have to you go and interview the family right through to <laughs> right through to Jason Donovan came and did a concert on the banks of Loch Lomond. Being able to interview Jason Donovan when he was really a thing was very, very exciting. So you did everything uh, in your patch. And then I was lucky because there again looking maybe for the pivot or the next opportunity we were in our patch was the Clyde submarine base so that was the new nuclear subs were trident was arriving on the Clyde in the time I was there this is the 1990s and I realized that that was a national story so I was at a local paper but had a national event on my doorstep and I I ensured that I made great contacts at the base, great contacts in politics. There was the um, there was the peace camp, Faz Lane peace camp. The whole tone of that was very, very important. And as well as doing lots of stories for the Lennox Herald, I also made sure I did stories for the Evening Times in Glasgow, the Glasgow Herald, and then Scotland on Sunday. And it was by doing that that Scotland on Sunday sort of spotted me. And then again, these things are serendipitous, aren't they, Mark, so often in life? The Windsor fire happened, the Windsor Castle fire happened, and Scotland on Sunday needed someone in London. Uh, the news editor of Scotland on Sunday knew I was from London and asked whether I would, it, I think it happened on a Friday, that was a Sunday paper, they didn't, they needed someone in London. Could I get down there? So I jumped in my old VW polo drove down to London overnight. My mother lived in West London near, and still does, near Windsor, quite not near Windsor, but, you know, on the right side of London at least. So I got to my mum's, I remember, at sort of five o'clock in the morning, washed my face, drove to Windsor, and then filed all day from the Windsor fire for Scotland on Sunday. I remember I had an old-fashioned battery phone with the battery you carried. First time I'd ever seen a mobile phone. <laughs> and again, Mark, then Scott on Sunday, quite shortly after that, offered me a job to come and join them. I think show a bit of maybe, um, I don't like talking, I suppose, about myself, because I think all of us have got this inside us. But I suppose it was that notion, I think entrepreneurial spirit maybe is right. I was very, I wanted to do well. I had this sort of drive that no one was going to hold me back. And I seemed to be 
pretty good at seeing opportunities. So like the Clyde base, I could see that was an opportunity to do uh, journalism on a wider canvas. So that got me into Scotland on Sunday. And then? Well, and then from there, the editor of Scotland on Sunday then became the editor of The Observer in London. Um, and actually, I went down to speak to him. And through that, um, I, I got connected into the Guardian Media Group. Um, and uh, that was, I was at the Nenets Herald, I think, for a couple of years, Scotland on Sunday for two, two and a half years. I was very fortunate. I won I won some awards in Scotland um, for, for the journalism, you know, we did there. I led on, but, um, you know, obviously without the paper, you don't have anything. So I was very fortunate. I became, as a very young journalist, I was what? 24, 25, as a young journalist, I became a little bit known. I won Young Journalist of the Year and some other awards. And so I was bit, I was noticed a bit in London. And uh, Scotland on Sunday won Paper of the Year as well. So we all came down to London. And again, people were noticing Scotland on Sunday. They've got a good roster of people. I had great colleagues, Rory Nicholl, Ewan Ferguson, you know, um, uh, Ray Clancy, you know, many others. Um, we were making a bit of noise. Scotland Sunday was growing fast. We were nipping at the heels of the Sunday Times in Scotland. And so Andrew Jasper then became the editor of The Observer. He was the editor of Scotland on Sunday. He invited me down for a chat. Um, that didn't quite work out, um, but I got a bit into the network. And then I um, uh, they were looking for a royal correspondent. And I, I think in those days, at the Guard this was at The Guardian. And I think at those days, there was still a slight notion of, why do you cover the royals? I think this was just at the time of the divorce, at the time of the Martin Bashir interview. It was just, the royal family were moving out of that rather that zone where some papers were a bit snobbish about covering the royals and why are we covering the royals and that isn't it just a soap opera to becoming really significant and they were looking for a new royal correspondent by then I was chief reporter at the um Scotland on Sunday that was that's the main lead reporter on the big story of the week so I'd just done a big piece I think it was on the Martin Bashir interview from memory these this is all quite a long time ago my apologies and Alan Rusbridger, who was then the editor of The Guardian, had seen that and asked me in for a chat and asked me whether that would be interesting for me as to become the royal correspondent at The Guardian. And I had to keep myself in my seat and not just punch the air in complete delight that I was given this opportunity. My mum had read The Guardian The Observer her whole life. I'd had it in the house that my whole life. I had read those papers my whole life. And that gave me the in into The Guardian as their, as their royal correspondent. And Mark, goodness me, I was suddenly, obviously with the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, shortly after, I was on the, I was on the biggest story of... of 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 the decade, if not the second half of the century, almost. Um, so again, Mark, lessons I'm supposing, you know, is what we'd love to get out of this conversation we're having. Yeah, being on it, looking for the pivot, uh, being entrepreneurial, being your best self and working as hard. I worked as hard as I physically could, sometimes to the detriment of my work-life balance. And I think that's worth just noting here. But also a lot of it is serendipitous. Sometimes it's right place, right moment. And I say right in an in an awful sense, because of course <laughs> it was appalling what happened, but suddenly I was working 18 hours a day. You you are you almost didn't sleep through that period. I remember my colleague Luke Harding, who's now one of the most esteemed Russia, particularly Russia experts on The Guardian and also a very famous author now. But Luke and I, he joined from the mail and I joined from Scotland on Sunday within a week of each other, and we sat together. And Luke and I, you know, became, you know, firm friends through that period. And we worked on the Diana copy for the for the for the paper. And you just didn't stop. You just didn't stop. Um, and so again, I was just there and that led to sort of those next opportunities. And um uh reflections on being the royal correspondent, favorite story. Your favourite is difficult. I remember doing the first trip to Dhaka with uh, then Prince Charles and and just just being amazed at the way you travelled as as the you know private jet, uh, you know the, the 
monogram foot slippers um the, just yeah, for me i you know i grew up in a two up two down house in west Ealing. you know um uh, i remember that going to dacher on that was probably my first really big foreign trip with a pack i'd done big foreign trips with scott on sunday but with a pack i think that was fascinating and going to dacher that was the first time i'd ever uh been to bangladesh and you know it was amazing um that was amazing obviously i wouldn't use the word favorite but but doing covering what what the death of diana princess of wales meant was an amazing um experience i, I was very fortunate to, to go to the funeral and i remember as her coffin was was brought in because she was going to be um in a mausoleum she was in a lead-lined coffin um and the soldiers who carried her it's incredibly heavy obviously the soldiers who carried her i remember seeing the sort of sweat and the effort of carrying her up the aisle at uh, westminster abbey and the tavern i think it was tavern wasn't it that was playing and the emotion of the weight not just of her actual coffin and herself but the weight of her image seemed to be there in that moment. And that was an, a, a remarkable experience. And still, Mark, I think I was still in my 20s. I, this, this had all happened before I'd hit 30, you know. It was an era of expansion. We had been in the media. We'd been through the Murdoch Revolution, the breaking of many closed shops, bad working practices, and that had led to this flourishing of media in the 90s. It was a real period of expansion. And I was very lucky to be able to surf that. So what came next? What what did the 30s hold? So the 30s, I was then, you know, having a wonderful time at The Guardian. I'd got to know Roger Alton, who is the editor of G2. Roger is one of my key mentors in my life and my career. Amazing, amazing uh, man. Um, uh, and also, um, so sadly, um, dead now, Georgina Henry, she was the deputy editor of the, of the Guardian. And those two really sort of took me under their wings. Georgina had been previously the media editor of the Guardian, then risen to become a uh, deputy editor. The media editor job came free. I, I became the media editor, taking over from a very dear friend of mine, John Mulholland, who became deputy editor of the Observer. Roger then moved over to the Observer to sort of reboot it. He was struggling. We need, he needed a new team. And he asked me to join him. I'd written for him on G2. We'd got to know each other quite well. I'd obviously done a huge amount of the royal coverage. I'd been me media editor, which was which at that stage, and still is, media was one of the, media editor of the Guardian was one of the kind of, you know, Rolls Royce positions. It was a very powerful section. It was a must read in the media industry in the UK and beyond. Um, so I was very fortunate then. I think I was I was about 30 then, I think. And then Roger asked me to become political editor at The Observer. I mean, and given, you know, my history, my love of politics, um, my desire to be in that kind of space. So again, I was incredibly fortunate I don't want to be sort of falsely humble. I believe I was good at what I did. I worked incredibly hard. I had great colleagues who helped me. And that opportunity, Roger, you know, wanted something different at The Observer, wanted someone from outside the brilliant lobby system, but he wanted a slightly different tone from The Observer of how we covered politics. And I was always very keen on that. Do it differently has always been a mantra for me, for journalism. And so, yes, political editor of The Observer, and then... And then from that, to become head of news at The Observer and go through the relaunch of The Observer, the amazing period The Observer went through. We won Newspaper of the Year, down to Roger. Yeah, it was an incredible time. I had an amazing years at The Guardian, amazing years at The Observer. You know, following Blair through the Iraq war was beyond belief. 9-11. You just have these amazing moments, Mark, in in a career, in my career, in a career in journalism, if you are fortunate enough to to uh, be successful in what is a it's a pretty brutal competitive business. Um, so yeah, went 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 to become head of news. Um, worked with John Mulholland on the redesign of the whole paper, 
We relaunched the paper. It was incredibly successful. We hit record circulations. We won newspaper of the year. Roger was an absolute, you know, huge figure in journalism. Um, many others on uh, on the paper. Nicola Giel, who was our head of magazines, who is now um, head of, um, you know, magazines and features at the Times Group. Amazing, amazing figure. Just very lucky, Mark, aren't you? In life, I had these people around me. Lucy Rock, who's now deputy editor of The Observer, was, was my deputy news editor at The Observer. You're lucky in the people you have around you. And Rogers picked a bloody good team. Nicola Giel, Paul Webster, John Mulholland, myself, many others who made that paper sink. And we made it work. And then, and then you left that paper to go to the Telegraph. No, I went to the Equality and Human Rights Commission. I think at this stage, I was nearing what might be described now as burnout. Um, and just being very honest with you, Mark, the work-life balance was not working. And I think all of us should think about that. I've, I've, I've been very fortunate in the relationships I have had in my life, in my personal life. Um, I have... I have not put enough into considering what work-life balance is. And I was getting to burnout. I was working so many hours and people around me couldn't cope. And I tried to make a decision to re-engage differently, following my values, but re-engage differently. So I went to the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, of course, then I was quite well known that the, the, the change program for the Observer became a bit of a case study. And lots of organisations came to me saying, could you come and do the same at X, at Y, and Z? And the Equality and Human Rights Commission, which was a new organisation, came to me. And um, Trevor Phillips was the chair. Nicola Brewer was the chief executive. And it was a very exciting project, a new way of reimagining how we have a debates about fairness and equity right back. This is what I can remember from my school days, you know, same conversation. And I thought, yes, and this will give me a chance to reset myself uh, in in work um, Monday to Friday rather than seven days a week, um, you know, and try and rethink how you're having relationships with your partners. I then had two children um, who are amazing people, obviously. So that was the reset in the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And then from there, the journalistic itch mark was just too strong. And yes, again, very fortunately, Will Lewis, very old friend of mine, I was at City University with him all those years ago. He asked me if I'd go and help him in his journey transforming the Telegraph Group, which he was already doing to great effect. And he asked me if, he, if I would join him and help him reimagine business and economics coverage at that group. So you did that and were hugely successful, Kamal. I think that's probably the time that I first got to to know you when you were uh, at the Telegraph uh, doing those roles. But then you got the call from the BBC to go and be um, their uh, primary journalist for business and, and then for economics. So how did that come about? Because it's very different being sort of anonymous yeah. in a sense behind a name in a paper. And yes. Being that's on the certainly nine true. Nine o'clock news or the ten o'clock news, whatever it is, and what? That's certainly true, Mark. Yeah, and as you say, Mark, um, the uh, it's when we first met and started discussing. So you know, thank you for your support through those kind of periods. The move from politics to business was a big move, but I've always had these underlying notions of skill sets. Skill sets are actually the same. C openly curious. I've never been tribal. Think about your audience first. What do they need to know? What can help them? So the journalistic skill sets, whether you're the political editor, whether you're the head of news, whether you're the business and economics editor of The Telegraph, whether you're the business editor of the BBC or the economics editor of the BBC or the political editor of the BBC, should actually be quite similar. Um, and I think if you have learned those skills and you have been successful, so I've done royals, media, politics, and then head of news and then business and economics, you know, uh, the BBC job, um, Robert was moving on, Robert Peston was moving on from the business editor job to the economics editor's job. And the job was advertised. And I I had done a little bit of television, you know, as business editor at the, um, at the Telegraph, but also at the Observer. And I, I liked it. I liked doing broadcasting. I liked the impact it had, you know, 
journalists usually have egos, you know, and I'm not shy to say I probably had a bit of that. As you say, Mark, I was a bit of a performer <laughs> um, throughout my career, um, sometimes to great criticism, but there we are. Uh, um, so when the job was there, speaking to my then partner, you know, she said, look, you should you should go for it. You know, it's um, it's a great opportunity. There is no more powerful role than working for such a the, the world's largest news organization and the most respected and most trusted news organization what's journalism it's about creating impact if you can create impact with the way you cover things then try and do it and i had a notion i think again maybe helpful for maybe some of the listeners i've always been very clear when i go for new roles new jobs new ideas what is sort of Kamal brings to this? So I had a very clear notion of what business coverage should be like. I was very lucky to have known Jeff Randall, for he'd obviously been a brilliant business editor at the BBC. I'd known Jeff Randall when he was editor of the Sunday Business, a new paper. And Jeff had been always a very good, you know, contact for me and a very good friend. Uh, we used to go for dinner together. Um, and um, I was very much on the Jeff side, the kind of um, Jeff side of the fence. The BBC needs to take business seriously and not always see it as a problem. And uh, Greg Dyke had introduced that when he was director general of the BBC, and Jeff had really lived that. He was that he was that business editor who really personified that idea, and I really believed in that. James Harding was the director of news. He had come from the Times as the editor. I knew James a bit. You just tend to know people, you know. He was media director of the FT when I was media director of the Guardian. And I made it very clear in the interview, this is what I wanted to do. I think I could communicate clearly. And I wanted business to be something that people understood as the lifeblood of any democracy that's based on capitalism. And I I, I, I hope and, well, obviously, you know, I was successful in that very tough process. Um, I hope that's what they wanted to hire. And I hope I did a little bit of that in, in the job. And did you enjoy working for the BBC as a reporter? Loved it. A great privilege. Look, Mark, I don't want to overplay this, and it's a very small violin, but I came from a very ordinary background with no journalistic network, um, you know, from my family. Um, and suddenly I was business editor of the BBC, and as you say, on the 10 o'clock news. I mean, literally. What? And then what? economics. And then economics through the Brexit referendum business editor through the Scotland, the Scottish independence referendum. These were huge, huge moments. I mean, I'd done the financial crisis at the Telegraph and that was huge. This was different order. You know, you are in people's living rooms. You have to be super respectful of the institution you work for and of the audiences you serve. And how do you best try and do that? And I had a very clear idea on that. But look, I was hugely helped by Robert. I was hugely helped by the BBC's economics and business teams. What a fantastic bunch of people. I've been very blessed, Mark, in our in my career. And I don't know, Mark, if I'm sure, you know, I would love, you know, your reflections. You should do, I should interview you for another podcast. Um, you need to be surrounded by great people because the, the public at the BBC, the public see the tip of the iceberg and that tip of the iceberg looks like Kamal Ahmed in business. But there's a big iceberg underneath there who are all working incredibly hard to keep you doing the right thing. Teamwork is essential to great broadcasting. Um, I loved it. The, the downside, if I can maybe sense where your next question is coming from, I found the public facing side of it and actually becoming a bit famous tiring and wearing and your public life being open to scrutiny your private life sorry being open to scrutiny and it got to the stage where you did get to the stage where you were recognized pretty much everywhere I mean through the referendum I was on air the referendum campaign Brexit I was on air all the time uh, through the election campaigns of which there were myriad. I was on air all the time. So millions of people would be seeing you every day. And look, as I say, these are tiny violins, Mark, but that was a tiring journey. I found after five years it, that, it, well, that was enough. That was enough. I didn't want to be a famous journalist. I wanted to be a good journalist. And I think I saw that there was an opportunity to help shape some of the future planning of the BBC under Tony Hall, 
who had a great modernization program for that place. And he asked, I applied and um, for the director of news job when James left, didn't get that, wasn't ready, frankly, to get that job, but wanted to apply, wanted to put myself forward. Another maybe quite small lesson from this, don't worry about applying for jobs you're not quite qualified for because you don't know where those tracks will end. And this was a real case in point. I applied to be director of news, probably one job too far for me, frankly, but I had a lot of experience in different areas. But actually, Tony then asked, would I join the news board, BBC News board as editorial director and help shape the future of news within the BBC, within his whole modernization process for the BBC. And that gave me an opportunity to support the BBC News in its in its modernization program. And I, I can remember having a conversation with you, Kamal, when you said to me that um, you wanted to move to the other side of the camera and that you wanted to move into management and organisation, which at the time struck me as quite a, a big pivot. But you did that and you were very successful. But take us on from there to setting up now uh, your new organisation. Um, which is to bring uh, the news to a younger generation. Um, so tell us about how that came about and what you're trying to achieve now with your new business, your new venture. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I've forgotten, of course, you helped me. I think mentors are really important. And Mark, I've always been very fortunate to have you as somebody has who's been guided, who has guided me. And I think those kind of conversations are really important from outside your sector, I think is really is really vital. I've always had a number of people around me who have been very helpful in those types of conversations. Um, you could tell there was a signal that we were all seeing in the sector, the media sector. I'll speak about the media sector first. We were seeing a signal that the system of the creation of journalism was not engaging certain audiences. And one set of audiences that were particularly not coming to the type of what might be described as traditional journalism that I'd grown up with were young people. And the Reuters Institute reports, which is one of the Bibles for anyone involved in the media, comes out of Oxford University, is brilliantly run. Fantastic expert there, Nick Newman, who is one of the kind of gods of research in the media industry in the UK and around the world. Um, he, had, he had revealed that one of the fastest growing audience sets within the media, within media consumption, was news avoiders. People who are literally not engaging with the news. Now, Mark, my passion has always been people should be informed by trusted, accurate, non-partisan journalism that is useful for you to navigate the world. Well, if people were turning away from the news, as a journalist, you needed to think about that because if journalism dies, democracy dies. And... You know, I am driven by values as well as ambition and ego and all the other things that we're all driven by and passion for your job and et cetera. And if value, if journalism is not there for my daughter who's 23, for my son who is 20, then that's a problem for all of us. And Will and I, you know, we'd worked together at the Telegraph, we'd been friends for 30 plus years, had been talking about this for many years, actually. It'd gone, gone right back a decade, really. We'd having this conversation. And we got to that stage in our careers where we could do something. I think... Um, as if you are fortunate enough to get to privileged positions, I suppose, how do you use those positions to do something, which to solve a problem? And Will and I, and without Will, the news movement would not exist. Will and I were both in a position to slightly think, okay, can we do something together? Will started it, and then he asked me to, would I join and reimagine editorial for this next generation of consumers and of employees and of citizens? And I must admit, Mark, and I don't know what if what you found with your, you know, setting up your brilliant business. It was actually a decision I made in literally a 30 minute phone call. You sort of feel there must be this massive origin story. And I grappled with it overnight and I had sleepless nights. And I remember Will called me and I was in my bedroom at home overlooking. I, I, had, I have a flat in, in East London. It was overlooking, um, overlooking Hackney Fields. I remember it vividly and Will was saying, well, this is what I'm trying to do. We've talked about this. You're interested in this. I'd given him some advice already. And then he said, you know, would you be interested? And I sort of then and there said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. 
they had made um, some posts redundant at the BBC. So, but the BBC had been incredibly generous. They had offered me many, many different opportunities uh, to plan for the future of that great organization. Um, I'd had some other options. I'd, I'd, I'd almost accepted a CEO's job, actually, Mark. I don't know if we spoke through that period. I'm sure we probably did. Um, and Will said, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Stay in journalism. It's outside journalism. Stay in journalism. Let's do this. And I sort of said, yes. And the main reason, actually, my partner um, is a lawyer, but she started her own business when she was um, 29. And she said, if you don't do it now, Kamal, you will always regret it. You've got a, you've got a chance to do something. And as you know, Mark, you know, we've both been on, you know, maybe some similar journeys over the last few years to, you know, in terms of building a new business. Um, just start because it won't be perfect. You can't plan how you are an entrepreneur. You just got to, you have to have a strong hypothesis, which we did have about storytelling can change. And therefore we can engage young people in the business of journalism and why it matters. And you need to be able to uh, uh, manage the notion of risk of just starting and seeing what happens. And we had a little bit of seed funding, which we'd put together um uh, ourselves so we knew we had a we had a shortish runway where we could keep going with the maybe about 10 of us a few more uh we needed to raise and i just decided my partner said if not now it'll be never and you'll always regret it this was an opportunity to solve a problem that was very obvious how do we create the next generation of news for the next generation of consumers delivered in the main where our audience is and that's on social media and so we started and it and it's brilliant Kamala. i mean the news movement I'm, i've signed up um and um i think that the way that you tell the news the stories um is really compelling and you've got brilliant young journalists um so it's amazing to see the way in which you've grown um a whole new media empire. Did, did, did what? What surprised you about the journey? What's been hard, and what's been most rewarding, based on all the other things you've done? It is a very tough job. Um, starting your own business. When you start, you have to do everything, from you know, and then of course raising money as well. These were all new skills that I had to. Learn. Will have been through a lot of this. Um, uh, himself, I was very fortunate. Will Will Lewis was formerly the chief executive and publisher of the Wall Street Journal. Dow Jones is a brilliant, the most brilliant media uh, executive. I would not have joined. I've been asked to join a number of startups um, in my career, and I've always turned those opportunities down. But when Will asks, you kind of have to think differently. I was incredibly fortunate to have Will alongside me. Um, for me, son, it was useful to have, also. He was a friend. That was actually quite useful. Um, what I found hardest is that you don't have guaranteed income. I'd come from a business where there was guaranteed income. Um, and I'd never had to think so carefully about every pound and every cent that we spent. Will also correctly, but made it a little harder for us because he said we're launching not just in the UK, but also in the US. And that meant not only um, culture-wise, journalism is different in America from the UK, but also, frankly, legally, we're incorporated in the US, we're incorporated in the UK. Just adds a layer of complexity to what we were doing, that we had a London and a New York office. So those are, that is difficult. It's not bad or negative. It's just hard work. You had to concentrate. We went on a um on a round on investor round with a deck and a narrative we had an incredibly strong hypothesis about we need a new news and this is why which people really engaged with we were actually oversubscribed for our um our series uh, a um or pre pre it's pre a really it wasn't really a pre a really to get us going um uh so those were hard what i found most delightful is working average age of our newsrooms is 25 
in America and in London, in the in New York and in London. We are incredibly fortunate that Associated Press, you know, 176 years old, renowned, well-renowned news provider, um, uh, was our partner, invested in us, supported us, ITN supported us at the beginning. National World Publishers of Scotland Sunday, where I used to work all those years ago, these things come around. Uh, Scotsman, Sheffield Star were supportive. Uh, we've helped them as well, launching them on TikTok, uh, looking at their YouTube strategy, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a great kind of network of people, but what was most brilliant was working with young teams. And I think the key, I initially was sort of, Will and I were of the idea, it needs Will and I to set this thing up with our other co-founders, Ram Beheshti, Dion Bailey, and uh, Eleanor Breen, the five of us, brilliant colleagues, all with deep understanding of the media industry. So we were the five. He needed us to set the thing up and be the outside facing to investors, to the industry, you know, et cetera, policymakers, people we wanted to work with. Um, and we should get out of the way of the journalism, let them run the journalism. But actually, I realized over time that it's a partnership actually is what you need. It's not about Generation X, my generation getting out of the way. It's about aligning the skills and passions and experience of young uh, people with the skills, passions and experience of the older generations and both together are the secret source maybe i talk about intergenerational sympathy not intergenerational conflict um and i think that's a really important learn thing that i learned i was much more we need to get off the mountaintop and let new people onto the mountaintop and a lot of young people say to me no 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 no, no. hang on hang on hang on we we we're on a journey as well we need it to be together you can't just kind of leave the football pitch um and I think that's been the most enjoyable thing is really learning. I've learned, this sounds a horrible, cliche. well, it sounds cliched. I've learned so much in the last nearly three years I've been doing this now uh, from my young colleagues who have grown so much, we've all grown so much together from how they have tested me on the way I think about what is journalism. And I think that's really helped. And to end, Kamal, for those who have been intrigued by this amazing story um, of um, your childhood through your amazing adventures through media and your huge success, you're also an author. You've written an autobiography about your mom. I was very fortunate, Mark. I mean, as you say, but, sorry, as I was saying, the, the BBC was an amazing experience. And also, of course, it, it it gave you platforms that I never imagined I would have. And right back to the start of our conversation, we spoke about writing and the power of writing and my love of writing. And I was very fortunate to be offered the opportunity to write. Not it wasn't it was autobiographical, but it was really to try and write about the immigrant experience in the UK from the point of view who of someone who is mixed black has a proud African heritage from Sudan and a proud white heritage from Yorkshire. <laughs> I am the genuine North-South uh, bringing together. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be uh, asked to reflect on that and to, you know, part, part, part autobiography, absolutely right, and part sort of disquisition on where is Britain on this issue of race and identity, 50 years on from the Enoch Powell speech. So, yes, The Life and Times of a Very British Man, published by Bloomsbury, was a highlight of, of my period at the BBC and, and would, would not have happened with the BBC. The BBC were very supportive. I took some time off from the BBC to publish the book. Um, it created, I hope, helpful conversations in this space. And again, it was all about partnership and understanding. I think for me, Mark, that, that notion of sympathy between different interests is really important. And the news movement has, what I'm so fortunate about is I've been able to live through the news movement. What that has meant to me as an individual, um, we are non-partisan. We, we, we try and take a nuanced view as far as we can. We know our own prejudices and privileges that play into everything we do. And 
our success, you know, we have grown to over 1.5 million followers. We get to tens of millions of young people every month. I hope our success has come from, I believe our success has come from that notion of the world is complicated. We don't want to tell you what to think. We want to help you think. And by helping you think, help you navigate the world. And those simple ideas, which really have been with me all my career and have been with Will all his career and are with many of the great editors and journalists I've met through my career. It's part of the DNA, I think, of great journalism is that notion of help the world to think, hold power to account, help people navigate the world is the job of the great journalist. And if I've achieved a little bit of that on my journey, then I am very proud. And I was very fortunate to be able to write a little bit of what I've learned through my career, through the book I was able to write. So for all of you listening, I would thoroughly recommend The Life and Times of a Very British Man. Um, and I would also highly recommend going on to um, uh, Kamal's new uh, business um, uh, and um, looking at the news in a whole new way. So the news movement, you can find it online, you can find it in all kinds of social media. Um, and Kamal, thank you, you have been a huge influence uh, on the United Kingdom through all the writing that you've done over many years, covering so many amazing events, being at the BBC, but also now striking out and doing something new. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and we all wish you continued success. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much for such a brilliant conversation.